10 years ago, Reed Duke, one of the best Magic the Gathering players in the world, wrote an article called Thought Seize You, all about the card Thought Seize. Little did he know that 10 years later, that card would still be incredibly relevant and the lessons from his article would be viewed by Magic players as foundational wisdom for improving at the game. Today, I'm going to be going through Reed Duke's article, talking through it, and explaining some of the context that maybe made sense back in 2013, but that needs a bit more explaining now because Magic the Gathering has changed since then, and references that were well understood at the time might not be as easily understood then. Anyway, let's dive in. Thought Seize You. Reed offers up a detailed primer on Thought Seize, an iconic magic card, <laughs> oh, you have no idea, that is being reprinted in Theros, covering everything from deck building to sideboarding to gameplay. Thoughtseize has come to be one of the most iconic cards in Magic. Though the card itself has not been legal in every format, the Thoughtseize effect is more or less ubiquitous in cards like Duress, which is a card we've seen more recently, Inquisition of Kozilek, and dozens of others. Now, with Thoughtseize being reprinted in Theros, its presence will be felt more than ever, and its status as a tournament staple is all but guaranteed for the next few years, in Standard, of course, and as, as has proven to be the case in every other format as well. Understanding how to use Thoughtseize will be integral to the success of any tournament player. Today, I'll cover everything you need to know about Thoughtseize, from deck building to sideboarding to gameplay. For those who do not know, Thoughtseize is a single black mana. For a sorcery, target player reveals his or her hand. You choose a non-land card from it. That player discards that card. You lose two life. The risks of Thoughtseize. Trading one for one. The first step is to understand what Thoughtseize really accomplishes in a game of magic. While it's a hyper-efficient card that sees extensive play, even in Legacy and Vintage, there are some heavy costs associated with the card as well. Thoughtseize, in terms of card advantage, represents a one-for-one -one trade. No advantage is gained directly. Therefore, step one in considering Thoughtseize is to think about whether your deck wants to trade one-for-one. -one. Good candidates for Thoughtseize along this metric might be Jund or Blue-Black Control. And back in those days, Jund was still a grindy mid-range deck. Blue-Black Control was still a control deck. Jund, however, was a lot slower because Modern as a whole was slower. And of course, when he says Jund and Blue-Black Control, he is referring to the Modern format. However, not every deck will fit this bill. A common pitfall that I see among newer deck builds is a draw towards Black-Red decks that feature both a lot of burn and a lot of Thoughtseize effects. This is natural because black and red are a likely pair according to Magic's flavor, and those are among the most iconic effects that each color has to offer. Now, when he says black-red decks that feature Burn and Thoughtseize, he's not talking about the black-red Evoke deck that has been seeing success in Modern recently that does play discard effects like Thoughtseize and Burn like Lightning Bolt. He's talking about, in a specific, like, Burn deck, adding Thoughtseize, as will become clear. But that is an important clarification because there are decks today that play Burn spells like Lightning Bolt and play cards like Thoughtseize, but uh, featuring a lot of burn means like playing like a lot of burn spells. So like the, the primary goal of the deck is to burn your opponent out. However, the reality is that Thoughtseize is exactly what a burn deck does not want. The strength of burn is that it's difficult for the opponent to interact with through ordinary means. So if you add Thoughtseize to the deck in the place of a card that would otherwise contribute to your game plan, you're really just giving your opponent exactly what they want, a way to trade cards off against you. If you've never played burn, it's basically a deck where Almost every card in the deck is a one mana version of a deal three to your opponent, or sometimes a two mana deal three to your opponent. And so what he's saying here is that the, the opponent's deck, unless they're playing a lot of counter magic, can't answer just, I draw my card, I deal three to you. And that's kind of the primary strength of burn and why it's able to kill quickly. And slowing yourself down to trade one for one cards with your opponent, if they could just discard their best card from their hand to make you discard a card, they would often choose to do that just to slow you down so they can enact their gameplay plan with their other cards. So that's what he's trying to say here. And uh, it makes a lot of sense. In my experience, such decks are excellent at getting the opponent down to five life, but are not the best at actually winning games. The same is true of ramp strategies like Mythic and Wolf Run Ramp. Mythic was a deck that just played all of the Mythic rares from the format. So it was like, just like what we just sometimes call money pile these days, where it just plays all the best cards, a lot of like expensive Mythic rares. And Wolf Run Ramp was a, car, uh, was a deck that used Kessig Wolf Run and cards like Inferno Titan and especially Primeval Titan to just ramp out and then use Kessig Wolf Run as a way to close the game once you had like your Primeval Titan down. So Wolf Run Ramp is a ramp deck. Mythic is just like a late game uh, ramp strategy as well that plays a bunch of ramp cards. I believe it was a Bant deck, so blue, white, and green. Green, of course, for the ramp. These decks devote such a high proportion of their cards to mana that each non-land card must have a very high impact on the game in order for the strategy to work. So a card like Thoughtseize 
the goal of which is to trade with an opposing spell, of which the opponent has many more than you, is not really what you're looking for. These decks can still consider Thoughtseize, especially as a sideboard card, for specific reasons that I'll get into below, but it's important to understand that its inclusion comes at a dear cost. So basically the idea is, if you have a very few number of top-end spells, you don't really want to be diluting your deck even further by playing a bunch of ramp spells that technically don't affect the board in terms of like adding power and toughness, and then also playing Thoughtseize to disrupt your opponent while you're trying to do that because you won't have enough slots for your top end guys. Redundancy. For decks that do want to trade one for one, Thoughtseize is appealing in its ability to accomplish that efficiently and reliably. However, it's still not perfect for every situation. In terms of tempo, Thoughtseize does not affect the board and trades with a card which the opponent has not yet invested mana into. Strictly speaking, casting a Thoughtseize puts you a little behind. Consequently, Thoughtseize is quite poor against a deck with a lot of redundancy. Redundancy in the context of a magic deck means that cards are very replaceable. Reed does such a good job writing these articles, by the way. Just like the fact that it has aged this well is incredible. Um, um, but just testament to his skills as a writer. Splinter Twin does not have much redundancy. Uh, if you've never played it, Splinter Twin is a two-card combo. Uh, in modern, it was blue-red. You use a card like Deceiver Exarch which lets you untap a permanent you control uh, when it enters the battlefield, and then you put Splinter Twin on it, so you tap it, your new Deceiver Exarch enters, you untap the one that has Splinter Twin on it, and then you just uh, untap the one that has Splinter Twin, tap it, make another Deceiver Exarch, untap the one that has Splinter Twin on it, and you just do that over and over, and it makes infinite uh, uh, copies that have haste, so you kill your opponent with a two-card combo. Splinter Twin does not have much redundancy because it needs to assemble one copy of Deceiver Exarch, one copy of Splinter Twin, and one cheap way to protect the combo. So like a counter spell. Thoughtseize is excellent against such a deck because when you take away the opponent's one Exarch, they have very few cards that they can draw that will help them recover from the loss and their deck functions poorly if they're unable to do so. So if you take the card they were going to put Splinter Twin on, then all of a sudden the Splinter Twin is useless as well, the protection spell isn't protecting anything, and their game plan can fall apart. The op opposite example is a very basic creature deck. Think White Weenie, which is the same as it was today as it was back then, or Mono Green Aggro. Thoughtseize would be at its worst against a deck of 20 forests and 40 Colonian Tuskers, so 2 mana 3-3, three, three, because it's overwhelmingly likely that you would take one Colonian Tusker out of the opponent's hand, and they would simply play a different one instead. The Thoughtseize effect is doubly bad against such a deck, because you cannot effectively attack their hand, and casting Thoughtseize does not help you keep up with the, what's on the board. You'd much prefer to have Doomblade, which is just a 2 mana kill spell for a non-black creature, which answers a creature that the opponent has already spent mana on, or you'd prefer to have your own creature, which will help you under any circumstances. Missing. What I haven't yet mentioned is the chance of missing with your Thoughtseize, which is a huge risk that I consistently see players underestimate. Missing with a Thoughtseize in this case is target opponent reveals their hand, they don't have any non-land cards in it, so like they have all lands in their hand, or they just don't have anything in their hand at all. So that's what missing with a Thoughtseize is. Games of Magic are won and lost on small margins, when you mulligan, when you get two for one, or when anything else happens that sets you behind on cards. The pressure falls on you to do something great in order to pull yourself back to parity. If you cannot, and both players have comparable draws, you will lose the game. I don't think I'd be able to overstate how bad it is to miss on a Thoughtseize, particularly in Limited or in a grindy matchup like a Jund Mirror. For you to want Thoughtseize in your deck, circumstances must be such that the risk of missing is very low or the rewards of hitting are very high. The risk of missing is the main reason why the card Thoughtseize tends to outshine other versions of the Thoughtseize effect. It's one of the reasons I've never registered Appetite for Brains, which lets you get rid of a card with converting mana cost 4 or greater, in a constructed tournament, and it's one of the reasons why Duress, which as we've already seen, gets non-creature, non-land cards, is typically relegated to sideboard. Coming down to top decks, let's compare the Thoughtseize effect to the similar and equally iconic Counterspell effect. So as we know, Counterspell is blue-blue, for counter target spell. At the time, counter spell wasn't legal in modern, it now is. The advantages of the Thoughtseize effect are you can cast Thoughtseize at your own convenience, while counter spell must be used in a specific window. You get to see the opponent's hand. Thoughtseize and similar cards tend to be quite cheap. Some cards cannot be easily countered. The advantages of the counter spell effect are you answer a card that the opponent has invested mana into, you protect yourself from top decks. There's a very famous phrase. Uh, you can't thought seize the top of their deck, and that's kind of what exactly what this is referring to. You'll come to regret the inclusion of thought seize any time the game stalls out and players begin playing off the top of their libraries. Drawing thought seize when the opponent has no cards in their hand or only lands is much the same as missing with it. It's an unfortunate quality of thought seize that it helps draw the game towards the top deck situation while also being an abysmal top deck in itself. 
and it draws you towards a top deck situation by stripping both players of cards that would advance their game plans and getting you both low on resources. Ask yourself during deck construction and during sideboarding how likely it is for the game to come down to a top deck situation. Indeed, sometimes it's your goal for the game to get to this point. Jund, Junk, Pox, and similar decks frequently have this goal. So Jund, classic, we know about that deck. Junk was, is, is the old, ver old name for Abzan because he wrote this article before Cons of Tarkir came out and Abzan was even a thing. So that's how long ago this article was from, whereas they called Abzan Junk. And so it would just be similar to uh, Jund decks, but it gained access to Lingering Souls uh, as like a token generator and value card as well. And so it would play out slightly differently from Jund. Pox is a deck that is just another grindy deck. It's not actually playing uh, this version of the card Pox. It would play a card called Small Pox, which makes basically both players sacrifice a couple of things and like they sack a creature, they discard a card and uh, things like that. So just both grindy decks that kind of thrive once both players are low on resources because they're built to capitalize in those situations. If it seems likely, then ask yourself how much you can afford to dilute your deck with cards that are so bad to draw in the late game. A simple way to weigh the risks and rewards of Thoughtseize is to consider it a card that's excellent to have in your opening hand and poor to draw at any other time. Before you start playing, try to predict how many turns the game is likely to go, and you'll get a number for how many cards you're going to see in a typical game. Compare the number of cards that you'll draw in your opening hand, 7, to the number of cards you'll draw off the top of your deck in the course of the game. When this ratio is high, as it is against a fast combo deck, Thoughtseize is more likely to shine. While it might not be intuitive, I found Inquisition of Kozilek to be an excellent card in modern Jund against decks like Affinity and Burn. Affinity did look slightly differently than it does today. Um, it actually played more like just an artifact aggro deck. It didn't really have tons of Affinity cards, and so it just played a bunch of cheap artifacts um, that kind of like got off to explosive starts and used like Mox Opal and stuff. Burn, again, very similar today to the what it was back then, just playing a bunch of... It didn't have like Monastery Swift Spear, but it still had Goblin Guide, plenty of Burn spells. The life loss on Thoughtseize can be a large cost and should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. For exa exactly this reason. When the ratio is low, as in something like a Jund Mirror, Thoughtseize is more likely to be a liability. For years, I felt confident, confident in my ability to win Jund Mirrors in Modern. Re even back then, Reed was still a master of Modern Jund. My secret is that I sideboard out every last Thoughtseize, Inquisition of Kozilek, and Duress that I have in favor of cards that are more powerful to rip off the top of my deck. I'm not sure if this would still be... Uh, a strategy that he uses today. I've watched a lot of his Jund videos. Um, I do know that he likes to shave copies of those sorts of things um, if they're not going to be good. But modern is really powerful these days, and like you generally want to be have tools to like interact with the powerful stuff they're doing. But this is still like a reasonable sideboard plan, especially in formats like maybe Pioneer, where you don't necessarily have to like deal with certain things in the value matchups like this. But yeah, in favor of cards that are more powerful to rip off the top of my deck. Almost invariably, both players have empty hands by turn 4 or 5, and against an opponent who has 6 dead draws in their deck from Thoughtseize and Inquisition, my chances to win a game from that point become quite high the longer the game drags on. To recap, be wary of including Thoughtseize in decks that do not want to trade 1 for 1. Thoughtseize has va lower value in a metagame full of decks with lots of redundancy, as we already saw with the green three draw, the green 2 mana 3 3s example. Look to sideboard out Thoughtseize against decks like this and in matchups that are likely to come down to top decks. Oh, don't say it. Sideboard it out against decks like this and in matchups that are likely to come down to top decks. I recommend restricting yourself to five or six copies of Thoughtseize effects in your main deck and seven between main deck and sideboard. This is my personal maximum that I adhere to in every format. The rewards of Thoughtseize. <laughs> so he's talked about how bad it can be. Now we get to the good parts. Now that I've warned you about the dangers of overloading your deck with Thoughtseize and its cousins, I'm free to explain why despite it, these weaknesses, it stands as one of the most useful tools available to a deck builder. Breaking up synergy. My philosophy in deck building is to focus on cards that are individually powerful by their own merits. However, this is not the only way to build magic decks. In fact, my friend and teammate, the esteemed Sam Black, who's still a great player today, takes much the opposite approach, looking for advantages in favorable interactions between cards. Such an approach has many benefits. Even my Tarmogoyfs... <laughs> will look foolish when they face down Sam's Bone Scythe Slither, Megantic Sliver, Siphon Slither, Sliver, and Gale Rider Sliver all in play at once. I insult Sam's creativity only in the interest of a simple example. Basically, when Slivers come into play, they give all of your Slivers a benefit, and so if you have all of these Slivers, they're just going to make your Slivers look absolutely huge. It's cards like Thoughtseize that allow the well-rounded Rock-style strategies. Rock is another term for Black-Green, and so... Uh, junk decks and Jun decks were both considered rock decks because black green is like the basis of those decks and uh, black green is the rock to compete against them 
the typically more powerful synergy-based decks. Thoughtseize represents a way to trade resources quickly and efficiently, and once you can force that Gale Rider Sliver to stand on its own, as just like a 1-mana one 1-1 one one flyer, your more powerful cards will win their individual battles. The Thoughtseize effect accomplishes the goal of breaking up synergy better than more situational answers like Doomblade, which is a kill spell as we already said, or Naturalize, which kills artifacts or enchantments, because of its ap applicability against creature-based strategies, control, and combo alike. Answering a specific problem. What's the first thing you do when you lose game one of your limited match to Primeval Bounty? And for those who don't know, Primeval Bounty is six mana. When you cast a creature spell, create a 3-3. Three, three. When you cast a non-creature spell, put three counters on target creature. When a land enters the battlefield, you gain three life. So it's an absolute house in limited. Presumably, your answer is something along the lines of feel sorry for myself or mutter curses under my breath. If so, what's the second thing you do? Personally, I scour my sideboard for Naturalize because it can destroy an enchantment. Solemn Offering because it can destroy an enchantment. Bramble Crush, it can destroy enchantments, or any other method I can find in desperation to get an enchantment off the table. But sometimes you're playing a black-red deck. Well, the Thoughtseize effect is a great way to answer a problem card that you can't otherwise handle. Before I broke down and added Golgari Charm, which can destroy enchantments, to the sideboard of my standard Jun deck, I was sideboarding Duress in against Mono Red Aggro with the goal of stripping away Burning Earth, which is a crazy throwback card, they tap a non-basic land, and it deals one damage to that player. And trying to win the game before my opponent top-decked another. It's not the perfect plan, but it's better than simply giving up. Plus, some cards simply cannot be answered after the fact. Imagine a black-white tokens deck that struggles a great deal against Supreme Verdict, which can't be countered famously for 4 mana. The best answer might be to try to take it away with Thoughtseize. I always rest a little easier when I have Thoughtseize in my deck, because I know that it represents at least a possible answer to nearly everything my opponent can throw at me. I'll return to the concept of answering a specific problem in the game to play section below. Seeing the opponent's hand. While it's hard to put a tangible value on seeing the opponent's hand, I've always found it to be quite a large advantage that most players undervalue. Personally, I was a player who developed good and precise technical play before I had much of a knack for reading my opponents. That's generally a good order to go in, by the way. Uh, because if you have good technical play, then you always like, then you're, at least you're not losing games to like just like making basic blunders. And reading opponents is, is like an advanced thing that you generally start to pick up the more you play yourself and the more experience you have because you start understanding what play patterns each deck is doing. Whereas when you're first starting out, you really want to just understand your own deck, your own gameplay, and that's something that's easier to improve. Perhaps it was due to my background on in Magic Online, or maybe just related to my introverted personality. But either way, when Jitaxian Probe was first printed, Jitaxian Probe is a card that is now banned in Modern. You can look at target player's hand, draw a card, and you can pay Phyrexian mana, so two life or a blue mana. So you don't even need to be a blue deck to play it. I added, and it just looks at their hand and draws you a card, so it replaces itself. I added it to all of my decks and began to win a lot more. I played Jitaxian Probe in decks that you wouldn't think could make particularly good use of it. Blue Black Control, Cawblade. Cawblade was a deck that used uh, a couple of swords, uh, like sort of Feast and Famine. It used Stoneforge Mystic. It used uh, the, the Caw part of that came from Squadron Hawk which is a great card that can carry the swords that you would get. And so it was like a control deck, kind of, it was a blue-white deck that was kind of control, kind of like had a lot of good good cards and it had Jace the Mind Sculptor in it. Just a deck that, it like won the Pro Tour uh, in the hands of Ben Stark. It was a really powerful deck and one of the best decks in modern at the time. However, <laughs> it was in its era, it was one of the best decks in modern. It got a couple cards banned from it. Like I think Jace got banned because of Cobblade, I think. Um, at least, yeah, I think that's what the case was etc. However, I found it easy to find a route to victory once all hidden information was laid out before me. The effect of seeing the opponent's hand is very powerful and can be life or death in certain matchups. Just as one example, consider the difference between a Storm player who casts Duress, sees the coast is clear, and takes their easy win, versus one who sees a handful of counters and knows to be patient and wait for more disruption. If you've never heard of what a Storm combo deck is, it basically plays a flurry of spells in one turn, non-creature spells like uh, that are rituals, so they're like jet, like cards that just generate you mana, cantrips like, uh, like uh, cantrips like uh, serum visions and things like that, and then it'll like play a past in flames, flash back all of its cards again, and then win with a grape shot. So it's like basically, if you've never heard of Storm, because it's not as prevalent in modern these days, Storm is basically cast a bunch of spells in one turn. But if they have a counter spell for your key, like pay off at the top end, sometimes it can just fold and just like completely lose to one counter spell. So that's why. Seeing the coast is clear, you can kind of get an easy win, quote unquote, and sometimes you have to be more patient. Creating a hole. The real key to Thoughtseize follows from the ability to see the opponent's hand 
and is what sets it apart from similar effects like Him to Turok, which is discards two cards at random, Cabal Therapy, where you name an online card, though you do get to see their hand with Cabal Therapy, um, but you don't get to see their hand before you cast it, which is the important part, and Counterspell. You see your opponent's hand, you consider the game, and then you decide what card to choose. Let's return to the topic of redundancy. I offered the All Colonian Tusker deck, once again, two mana, three, three, as an example of a deck with so much redundancy that Thoughtseize becomes a liability. However, the real-life equivalent of such a deck can sometimes be surprisingly vulnerable to Thoughtseize. Even if we restrict ourselves to mono green aggro decks, we'll, they will still play to mono green aggro. Decks will still play their creatures on a mana curve, starting at one and reaching up to four, five, or six. They might have combat tricks or finisher cards like Overrun, which gives your team plus three, plus three, and Trample. So just like, there's a lot of cards that get called Overrun effects these days, and this is like the original one. Just like, huge buff for all of your creatures. You usually win the turn you cast it. They might have utility cards or Planeswalkers. When you cast Thoughtseize, you can see what resource or category of card the opponent is short on and attack that. If you see a hand of weenie creatures, weenie creatures just means small creature, you can strip the one giant growth, one mana plus three plus three, and feel safe behind your Sangir Vampire, five mana four four. If you see a handful of top-end finishers, you can strip their one cheap play and push your early advantage. I made the claim earlier that Thoughtseize puts you behind on tempo, but this is truer in a technical sense than in practice, since you can use Thoughtseize to break up an opponent's mana curve. And earlier he was saying it puts you behind on tempo because you spent mana uh, on the card and they didn't spend mana on the card that you took. And so you spent mana they didn't, that's tend to be a tempo disadvantage. To since you to break up the opponent's mana curve. If you cast it early in the game and they only have one strong play to make on the following turn, or if you can plan further ahead than that, you can strip that one card and make them waste their mana. Game waste their mana by not casting anything that turn, so they just pass back after playing a land. Gameplay, casting thought seeds, creating a hole against the control deck. With regard to redundancy, we've discussed creature beatdown decks and we've discussed synergistic combo decks. A third category of deck against which thought seeds really shines is the reactive control deck. While control decks often feature cards that are individually good, they do require a proper mix in order to function properly. For example, not enough creature defense and you can lose to a quick rush. No counter spells and you can lose to a planeswalker. No finishers and you can flood out and lose the game. Late game. These are the matchups where creating a hole is most important. I believe that Thoughtseize has become even better against control decks as the card pool of magic has expanded and is particularly powerful alongside Planeswalkers. I love playing Jund against control decks like Blue, White, Red, sometimes referred to as American Control back then. You'll notice he's not saying Jeskai, as we often do these days, because Jeskai was not uh, in existence, as we already established, because Khans was not out yet. In both Standard and Modern, because there are so many possible approaches to the game, and it's a fun challenge to find the best one. Standard Jund, after sideboarding, will have powerful creatures, Planeswalkers, Rakdos's Return, which can make them discard cards, and deal damage, Underworld Connections, which is just a card advantage engine, and sometimes even more angles of attack, like Acidic Slime, dealing with lands, uh, land destruction, or Rurik Thar the Unbowed, which just punishes them for casting non-creatures, if you can get it into play. Granted, Blue White Red has ways to beat any and all of these cards, but it's difficult for the opponent to have them all at any one time. It's nearly impossible when you're duressing them. When you cast duress, you get to see your opponent's vulnerabilities. If they have too much removal, then maybe you shouldn't even bother trying to beat them with creatures. Just take away their counter and resolve a Rakdos's return. On the other hand, if you duress on turn one and they have a handful of dissipates, which is a three mana counter spell, take away their detention sphere, a three mana removal spell, and you and see what you can stick in the first three turns of the game. Example, you have two lands in play and your opponent has one. You cast duress on turn two, and these are both players' hands. Your hand, you've got a couple of lands, including a Cavern of Souls, which can importantly make one of your creatures uncounterable, uh, one creature type, an uh, Underworld Connections and Arachnos Return, which we already discussed, uh, non-creature ways to get card advantage, and a Huntmaster of Fells. Opponent's hand, they have a couple of counter spells, Syncopate, Negate, Dissipate, they have a removal spell in War Leader's Helix, and Thundermaw Hel Hel Hellkite as the top end card. Generally speaking, Underworld Connections is one of the best cards against Blue White Red, but the key to this situation is that you need to ignore it, at least for the time being. This duress has shown you your opponent's strength, a lot of counter spells, and one possible weakness, not many answers to a resolved creature. They only have the War Leader's Helix. In this example, I would take War Leader's Helix and use Cavern of Souls to resolve Huntmaster of the Fells. Huntmaster is not traditionally one of the best cards in the matchup, but in this case, it's what the situation calls for. The opponent has plenty of top decks that can answer the Huntmaster, but at least if they tap out for Supreme Verdict, the board wipe we already saw, or Thundermaw Hellkite, you'll have a window to resolve a spell in spite of all their counters. 
you're unlikely to have much luck trying to brute force through all of those counters. So basically, you want to use your thought to take the card that they have the least of, because in this case, if you take a counter, they're still just going to counter your underworld connections with their other counter spells. But if you take Warleader's Helix, maybe your Huntmaster goes unanswered for a few turns. So basically, the idea is you strike where they're weak. If they had instead like four, co like three copies of Warleader's Helix and one Syncopate, you could take the Syncopate and resolve your underworld connections on your next turn, and then then their Warleader's Helix kind of rots in their hand. Uh, I guess if they had four copies of it, though, they would burn you out potentially, but you get the point. Uh, yeah, that's the general idea. Answering a thought, uh, answering a specific problem. The gameplay of Thoughtseize comes down to two questions, when to cast it and what card to take. The two questions are related. Once you know the matchup, ask yourself what the most important cards are to take with your Thoughtseize. In the example of the limited matchup used above, I've sideboarded into rest with the goal of stopping my opponent's primeval bounty. As we already talked about, six mana enchantment, game winning bomb. The ideal time to cast duress is probably the turn right before they hit six mana, since that's the time they're most likely to have the bounty in their hand. So basically, if you cast duress on turn one, you only get to look at their opening seven cards, and then if they later draw the primeval bounty, you won't be able to take it away from them. However, if you wait until they have five mana in play, you can cast duress, and then if they had primeval bounty in their opening hand, they'll still have it in their opening hand. And if they've drawn it over the course of those turns that they were getting their land drops down, so at least five more draw steps, then you get to see you have a much higher chance of them having the primeval bounty in their hand so that you can take it, which is actually a huge level up moment with your thoughts, these type effects. Another thing you can do is if you really want to resolve a key spell through counter magic, you can sometimes wait until the turn before you're going to cast your key spell, or sometimes wait until you can cast them both on the same turn, because then your opponent's in the situation where potentially maybe they have multiple counter spells in hand, but they only have enough mana to like cast one of them. So, eh. You, you kind of can overload their spells with, through counter magic. That's a little bit of a different thing. But you can cast your duress on the same turn as your other key spells so that you can take their one counter spell if they have it, uh, which is kind of the important thing. So you want to cast it the turn before they hit their mana. The, the overload thing is like if your opponent has two counter spells and you have two threats, you want to like save it until you can cast both threats in the turn so that they maybe can't cast both, both counter spells. Like if you have two two drops you want, then on turn four, you can cast both two drops. And if they have a three mana counter, they can only counter one of them. So that's kind of that, that concept. But that's a little different thing than what Reed is talking about. That was something where I just inserted that into the uh, narrative. But you maybe know what they have in their hand if you've cast the Thoughtseize. But yeah, you want to wait until the turn before they hit six mana. If I'm playing Jund and my opponent's playing black, white tokens with the troublesome Oriok Champion, which is protection from black and red, so basically unkillable against Jund and just gains a bunch of life. Then I'm going to make sure I cast Thoughtseize on turn one when I'm on the draw and by turn two when I'm on the play because you can't answer it otherwise. I could go on and on with examples of proactive problem cards that your opponent could have, but the answer is typically going to be cast Thoughtseize as late as you can conveniently do so without giving them a chance to cast the problem card. It's important to note that in reality, there are frequently multiple problem cards in any given matchup, in which case you need to adjust accordingly. Say Primeval Bounty player is also green-white and also has a Johnny Caller of the Pride, which is a three-mana Planeswalker that can just take over the game uh, if, if left unanswered. If you just if you get another creature into play, it can do some good stuff. Um, it's not like a crazy Planeswalker a lot of the time because it doesn't make creatures or anything like that or function as removal, but buffing a creature and then giving it Flying Double Strike is pretty devastating. It would be foolish to wait too long on your Duress and let them stick the Planeswalker because then you might lose a game where they don't even draw Primeval Bounty. The more interesting situation is when you're dealing with reactive problem cards. So reactive being like counter magic. Remember the Wolf Run ramp deck from earlier, which doesn't love the idea of playing with Thoughtseize because it doesn't want to trade one for one. So as a reminder, Wolf Run ramp plays a lot of like top end cards like Primeval Titan and then finishes them off with like Kessig Wolf Run, which is, if you've never heard of it, it's a land that you can pump a bunch of mana into to buff your creatures. So it's like a late game, late game ramp deck. This might be a deck that has a really hard time beating Dissipate, the counter spell, and needs to sideboard Thoughtseize with the primary goal of stripping a Dissipate and resolving a Primeval Titan. So six mana, six, six, tramp modern staple in Primeval Titan decks, and yeah. And in this case, you want to be as patient as possible with your Thoughtseize, waiting until the turn before or the turn you're ready to cast your Titan. It would be awful to fire off your Thoughtseize on turn one and then have them draw into Dissipate in the meantime. The trickier situations will arise on turn five when you don't have a Titan in your hand, but are hoping to draw one, or when you have a Titan, Thoughtseize and six mana, but no seventh land in hand. These should be ca handled case by case, depending on how desperate you feel and how much you can afford to be patient. If I'm forced to make generalizations, I would try to hold my Thoughtseize in the first example until I draw a Titan. I would then cast Titan Thoughtseize right away in the second example so that I can play Titan the following turn, whether I draw a land or not. Notice that in all of the examples given so far, the only time Thoughtseize has been cast on turn one 
is when we're on the draw against a deck with Oriok Champion. Thoughtseize does not have to be cast at the earliest possible moment, unless there is a special reason why you would want to play it that way. I'll close today by making some general suggestions on how to use Thoughtseize when you do not have a specific goal in mind. So these specific goals are like stopping a specific counter spell or stopping a problematic card like Oriok Champion. I will also say that in Modern Age Magic the Gathering, 10 years after this article came out, Thoughtseize gets cast on turn one a lot of the time because there is oftentimes a special reason why you would want to play it that way. There's so many powerful things your opponent can do in the early stages of the game. There's free interaction in the form of solitudes and uh, subtleties and furies, and there's just grief combos that can come out. So casting your thoughts on turn one is oftentimes going to be correct these days if it's your only play, just because you want to be able to stop your opponent from doing their powerful things. So against like a Rakdos Evoke deck, if you play thoughts on turn one, you can like get rid of the card that they need. Like you can take their, their, uh, their grief or something like that. And if you just play like a tap land, then they just get to completely wreck you when you had Thoughtseize in your hand to stop them. So Thoughtseize gets cast on turn one a lot more these days than maybe when Reed was writing this article. But I will say the fact mo almost all of the stuff from this article is still totally correct with how to use Thoughtseize. Thoughtseize for value, when to cast Thoughtseize. Do not let Thoughtseize ruin your own game plan. It should simply be one more tool to use at your convenience and not a card that should force you to go out of your way. Unless I have a reason to do otherwise, I will play my creature instead of playing my Thoughtseize. Unless I have a reason to do otherwise, I will play my tap land instead of playing my Thoughtseize. I do not know whether Thoughtseize will go up or down in value each additional turn I wait, so I will make plays that I know are time sensitive, playing creatures, and will not pay a tangible cost, two life on a shock land, in order to play Thoughtseize sooner. I think a lot of the time these days you will pay two life to play the Thoughtseize sooner, for the exact reason I mentioned before. Shutting down your opponent from getting a grief going or getting their uh, expedition map down on turn one if they're playing Tron. Like in the dark, there's just so many powerful decks that are trying to assemble very specific engines or synergy pieces um, that it's really good to cat. Like the first turn of the game has become a lot more important, I would say. Whereas sometimes, like even against decks that you might not think think of, like you want to be casting your Thoughtsies early just so that you can like nab their like one drop accelerator so they don't get to play their delighted halfling or whatever it is so i would say that playing thoughtsies on turn one is a lot better than like in the case of a shock land you often will play like shock land and thoughtsies unless you're against like specifically burn in which case you're probably sideboarding out thoughtsies and in game one you wouldn't know they were playing burn unless you were on the draw and yeah so thoughtsies oftentimes will get played off of a shocked fetch land example you're playing modern jund back in the days i mean honestly all these cards get played in modern jund a lot today as well which is just kind of a testament to how strong these cards were 10 years ago, back before all of the other cards that often get played today were played. Your hand on the play against an unknown opponent. In this scenario, I would play Blood Crypt Tap. That's just, yeah, probably not something you would do these days. I I, I would heavily suspect that in Modern Era Limited, uh, not Limited, in Modern Era Constructed, he would just play like Shock in a Blood Crypt and then Thought Seize his opponent just so that they can't like do something crazy. And that way he knows, okay, I can take their non-creatures and then kill their creatures and stuff like that. I would play Thoughtseize on turn two and play Overgrown Tomb tapped. Eh. There's no predictable play my opponent can make on turn one that I feel I desperately need to stop. If they play Deathrite Shaman back when this was legal in modern, which is crazy to think about, I can bolt it and Thoughtseize on turn two if they Thoughtseize me. My hand is fairly redundant and I'm not afraid of losing any particular card. If they cast Serum Visions or hold up Spell Snare, I don't really care. I probably wouldn't have taken those cards anyway. If I were to top deck a two, -deck creature, two drop creature, my patience will have cost me a little bit. But Jund isn't a deck where you really need to rush. Life is important, and it's not even clear that Shock Myself, Thought Seize, Shock Myself, Dark Confidant will be a great play. Dark Confidant is a two drop that costs you life to draw you extra cards. It's a two mana, two one, basically. Um, but reveals the top card of your library on your upkeep, and then you get to draw it. Uh, you put it in your hand and lose life equal to its mana cost. So it's a card advantage engine that oftentimes they play discard spell to clear the way, play Dark Confidant, and then ride a little bit of value to victory. I stand to gain two life and have extra information by paying the small price of waiting one extra turn on my Thought Seize. Thoughtseize for value, what card to take? A convenient time for casting Thoughtseize has finally presented itself, but you still have no special goal in mind. First, look at the opponent's hand and see if you can create a hole, aka create and exploit a vulnerability. It, as we already discussed, getting rid of their like answer to your creatures when they have a bunch of counters, or vice versa, or like getting rid of their two drop when they only have one so they have to skip their turn, all those things that we already looked at. If you can't, no problem. There's no need to try to force anything or get impatient. Just take their most powerful card. In Modern, I have a hierarchy of cards that I like to thought seize away against blue, mi blue mid-range or control decks. When in doubt, I take Snapcaster Mage. Back then, Snapcaster Mage was absolutely fantastic, 
These days, it's very fringe playable. If there's no Sackmaster Mage, I take Cryptic Command. Once again, Cryptic Command, very fringe playable, and uh, not really the pinnacle as it was back then. If there's no Cryptic Command, I take Sphinx's Revelation, which is just completely unplayable in Modern Age, in uh, Modern Age like Constructed, or some other powerful late game card. Uh, I also have a so like you can just kind of view this as like oh I'm gonna take their best card if it's not best card I'll take their second best card or their third best card just like Snapcaster is like a generic like a powerful card that's flexible this card is just like a powerful thing but you can maybe play around it potentially if you like know they're gonna hold up four mana for it and then this is just like a late game card so like you just want to get rid of the answer the late game powerful card I also have a rule this is a really key thing that really holds up today still I also have a rule that I never tried to mana screw my opponent. Lots of experience has simply led me to view it as an unreliable strategy. I never take a Mox Opal, which is like a land substitute for Affinity decks, or Springleaf Drum against Affinity, which is also like one mana, you then you can tap your creatures to tap for mana, essentially. So it's like mana substitutes. They play them instead of lands to some degree. I would never take a Mox Opal or Springleaf Drum against Affinity ever. If my opponent kept a one lander with Serum Visions, which is a cantrip that they could presumably use to uh, draw towards more lands, I'll often still take their Snapcaster Mage unless I really think I can put a lot of pressure on them and close the game fast. Eventually, your opponent will draw out of their mana screw, and you'll regret not taking their more powerful card. If they don't, then you will win anyway, which is a really important thing. Sometimes they'll just draw two lands in a row, and then you're like, oh gosh, I wish I'd really just taken their good card instead of their random cantrip. So that's a really key point that I think really still holds up today. Putting it all together, I hope this primer has helped you to better understand thought these, if only in a small way. The card is an incredibly powerful tool that all tournament magic players should know how and when to use. However, it carries a substantial amount of risk with it as well. As, however, it carries a substantial amount of risk with it as well. To recap, Thoughtseize doesn't belong in just any deck. As we've already discussed, Thoughtseize in, is in the decks where you want to go to the late game and you don't you don't have a late game that is reliant on playing like powerful top end cards so you can afford to like rely on individual card quality. Uh, to like outpower your opponents by just having better spells than them. So you don't want it in like your ramp decks necessarily, unless it's in the sideboard to clear the way for counter magic. And you don't really want it in your decks that are like uh, super like like a burn deck that Thoughtseize just slows them down. You want it in your like mid rangey decks like Jund. Sideboard it out against decks with redundancy or when the game is likely to come down to top decks. Think ahead about what cards you most want to take with Thoughtseize use it to answer the cards that you can't easily answer otherwise. So the example of waiting until the turn before their key card to play your Thoughtseize. When you cast Thoughtseize, try to create a hole. Look for vulnerability and push that angle of attack. When in doubt, get maximum value from your Thoughtseize by casting it at your convenience and taking your opponent's most powerful card. Keep these tips in mind, and Thoughtseize will serve you well across many formats and for many years to come. How right you are, Reed Duke. So this fantastic article really covers a lot about Thoughtseize and really just targeted hand disruption in general. And I really do hope you enjoyed the breakdown of it and also just the article in general. Thoughtseize is a key card that is still played frequently today. And there are a lot of cards like this, like Duress, which get frequently reprinted. So you play them in Standard and Modern and Pioneer and pretty much every format plays these cards. So this uh, article from 10 years ago is still very relevant. And I hope you found it helpful to help level up your gameplay. And if you've never heard of it, then I hope that I exposed you to this fine piece of writing. That's going to do it for this video. If you would like to see more article st breakdown style videos in the future, let me know which ones you'd like to see in the comments. I do have a list of articles to go through, but I'm always looking for more good ones. And to let me know you made it all the way till the end of the, the video, leave hashtag thought sees you in the comment section down below. That's going to do it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it and I will talk to you next time.